back with 50 and 50. Huge thanks to Minko Pro Genetics for support and putting this 50 vlogs, 50 vlogs together in 50 days with me. And I suppose today I'm going to talk about cattle parasites in the first year in cattle grazing systems. And this looks like a very busy slide. And you know, once upon a time, we had products that treated worms and we controlled them. And I'll, I'll talk about why that might be changing and some of the approaches and the strategies we need. Uh, I suppose if I look at parasites, they're having a big impact in grazing systems on performance, profitability, and they're becoming a limiting factor on some farms. And there's a number of issues, because, there's a number of reasons for that. If I look at uh, common parasites, roundworms I'm going to typically, I'm going to focus on predominantly today. They are our stomach and intestinal worms, our cuperias and our uh, ostratasias predominantly. Then we have fluke and liver, liver fluke and rumen fluke, which cause a lot of issues. And then we have lungworm, which almost needs to sit in its own separately because it's caused big issues on farms as well. It is a roundworm parasite. But predominantly I'll be focusing on roundworms. I think I'll come back to, to lungworm, certainly liver fluke again on their own. Um, okay, we must remember with all these parasites, it's a key thing that they have a life cycle. Apologies, I should have drawn this out bigger. But uh, in grazing systems, uh, cattle must ingest infective larvae. Uh, so we have several stages. We have an adult, adult worm, which produces eggs. Those eggs hatch out into thousands. Uh, and they produce the larvae and they go through different stages of growth until they become infective, different stages of larvae. And this cycle takes generally about three weeks. And the stage from uh, the L1s here to infective larvae, that can vary depending on weather conditions, we'll talk about that. So the life cycle is important. You must remember when it's with round worms and lung worm that animals develop immunity. So in their second season, and we ideally with uh, adult cows shouldn't be worm dosing them for either lung worm or round worms. Um, but liver fluke, doesn't develop resistance and nor does rumen fluke. So there, that's a challenge there for farms that are dealing with it. So immunity is an important story, particularly in lungworm. I talk a lot about lungworm vaccine, probably potentially been a, a real, uh, something we must engage more with. But on roundworms, I suppose we don't have any vaccines. We uh, have a certain number of products licensed for um, treatments. These are our antelmentics. And you know, 1960s, I think the white the benzimidazoles were developed. And then we had the yellow drenches, the levamazoles, and then really transformational, the, the ivermectins, the clear drenches were developed and they can be long acting, they have a persistency, that's why they're slightly different to these other ones. And they've been very, very effective. And they've got cheaper as well and they've, they've been really a tool that we've used to control parasites. So a lot of us spend a lot of time over here controlling parasites with these products. Um, there's changes coming here, a number of changes. There's legislation changes, particularly around making these prescription medicines and there's a bit of debate about this. but. Um, cause they're such a precious resource, we've over, over 200, I think I counted at one stage, uh, warming dose, doses for cattle on the market. But there's only three active ingredients, and that's important to remember when we think about warm dosing, that there's three active ingredients. And the challenge that we are seeing on farm, we've seen it on flocks and sheep farm for a number of years, and now we're seeing it in cattle, is antelmintic resistance. And what is this? Basically, it's the parasites themselves have become resistant to the products that we use to treat them, to, to kill them. And what happens is if we have a group of parasites and we're continually dosing with the same product over a period of time, um, that they're smart, these parasites are designed to survive, you'll get resistant worms developing in a population. And over time, the resistant worms grow in the population because when we're dosing an animal uh, with a worm dose, we're killing the susceptible parasites and all we're leaving is resistance. So the population grows. And that's a real challenge. And we're now seeing from studies that we have resistance across all three of these categories on, on our, our farms, both in dairy and beef farms. So we need to be mindful of that. So I'm going to talk about sucker calves and dairy calves because their management around parasites is different and particularly of course that is because your suckler calf is on uh, her mother, she's drinking milk for the, or he is drinking milk for the first uh, weeks and months of, of their time on pasture which reduces down their risk. With dairy calves from turnout, they're sort of exposed straight away. The parasite journey becomes straight away. And typically what we would have done was strategic dosing uh, over time periods, three to four weeks out from turnout. We would have gone in with a dose and we would have dosed periodically to keep control. And then we would have moved to these clear um, drenches, which have been a very effective. Uh, and some of them are long acting. You can get them in a bolus. And they would have controlled parasites uh, over time. Now, I'm not saying that the products don't have a role, we just need to be mindful that we've no new warm dose products coming into the marketplace. We have the issue of, the, of resistance developing. So we need to think a little bit differently about parasite control. There's a number of factors here. 
And I think EFID, every farm unfortunately is different. It's one of the challenges when I write about parasites that people, and I talk about them, people just want a program for their farm that they can take home um, and something that's repeatable and easy to use. And that's what the products gave us. They gave us simplicity. We don't, we have to move. And, and this board signifies, I suppose, you know, if it was 15 years ago, I would've been talking about this. I would've been very much focused about strategic dosing. Now we've got to look at all the other factors in the grazing system that impact parasites. And if I start up here, the weather is an important one. For that life cycle, a lot of these parasites leak moisture and warmth. And if we have um, those right conditions, particularly around lone worm, um, it can be very favorable. So we need to look at the weather. So 2018 was a good example when we had a drought that for a period of six to eight weeks, we had very little parasite activity on farms. Fecal egg counts were low on sheep and cattle farms. And then we got rain in August and we got the right weather conditions again for grass growth. And what happened was the parasites uh, really rapidly evolved out, you know, these larvae developed very fast in this cycle of thousands of eggs and we started seeing clinical symptoms. So the weather is important. If the weather is dry and warm, it's unfavorable for those larvae who burn themselves out quite quickly um, to develop on pasture. You can almost look at it, and I've heard men talk to many uh, experts in this area of parasitology, that you know the favorable conditions for grass goat are the same favorable conditions we look for parasites. And that's a challenge in our grazing systems as well. When we look at the clean out of swards down low, that's where the parasites are. So we wanna maximize grass utilization, but we must be mindful that it also brings the risk with this limiting factor of parasites. If I look at suckler calves, turnout date, depending on what it is, you, you're, going to, you're going to have less grass intakes until they're starting coming up to midsummer and weaning. So the, the, the risk is dramatically reduced. So really, when we look at strategies and warming, I suppose we, we've got to look at grazing management as part of that. And for both dairy and beef calves, if they've been turned out to the same paddocks each year, you have a build-up potentially of parasites in that pasture. Remember, coccidiosis is a big player in the early season as well with calves, and must be mindful that some of the clinical symptoms uh, and performance losses we'll see uh, could be related to that. So it's not just um, it's not just parasites. So if you look at dairy calves going out to the same training paddock every year before uh, maybe just, just at turnout, that can increase the risk of coccidiosis and maybe the ingestion of worms. And typically as well, in, in rotational grazing systems, we've got to look at what animals were on before that. If you look at suckler calves, um, co-grazing with sheep actually massively reduces the risk. If we look at uh, suckler calves going on to pasture was grazed by sheep only, again reduces the risk. Reseeds, again, obviously because of their nature, they're reducing the risk down. And I think some of the exciting research on, I suppose, from a grazing management perspective on parasites is mixed species swards. Um, particularly for two, for, I suppose there's two reasons that I've investigated to make sense. From a mechanical perspective, if you think about rye grass being straight up, the parasite is a very easy job to get onto that leaf, to get into that animal. With the chicories and the plantains and those other, it's a more difficult journey for the parasite to get uh, into the animal. But also, there's this element that the likes of plantain contain tannins, which potentially will reduce down um, and have an antelmintic properties. Now, the research is ongoing on this, but with mixed species swords, there is an opportunity here, possibly as part of an overall system. Remember the weather, um, grazing management, it's, it's just some of the factors. So if we have calves going out in the same uh, paddocks year after year, um, we, we have a risk there. With your suckler calf and your dairy calves, a key thing to remember, just before I go there, I've forgotten this one, and that's very important. Obviously, nutrition, um, minerals, those key elements for the, the, the summer months at grazing are managed well. Um, where they're poor, we're opening the door even more to parasites. So they're, they're the building block of good health management for the, for the summer and good grazing management. So, how do we manage um, parasites? What, what do we, we, we can still, we still use these products, but what we need to get better at is probably the timing of them, the usage of them, the rotation of them year to year. So we're not using the same product all the time. And really, to me, if we know the clinical symptoms of roundworms, say for being uh, weight loss, scour, poor tribe, that we need to be mindful and watching that on a regular basis. We need also to combine a bit of science with fecal egg counts. And what we're doing with faecal egg counts is we're, this, is, this is a microscope, we're using microscopes to look at faecal samples to check how many eggs in a gram of faeces. And that'll give us an indication, uh, particularly where we're looking at groups of calves, say groups of suckler, groups of dairy calves, what is you know, pool samples on a regular basis, 
how, what levels of egg warm eggs are in our dough and then we can decide whether we need to go in with a dose or not based on weights as well weights are really important okay because weights clinical signs of fecal egg counts that to me those three components if they can be if they can be in, incorporated with some of this other stuff is a really sustainable uh, warm management plan so we need to look at fecal egg counts and weights and in our suckler calf that you know we have a period where we can wait what i found with suckler calves we've done suckler herds we've done this is we can push out the first dose quite a bit because the risk is lower and we're looking at weights we're looking at fecal egg counts and then we time our first dose much more strategically on farms in dairy cows because it's earlier we tend to have to go in with doses earlier now with low more and i would cover this in its own again very unpredictable fecal egg counts aren't as useful clinical signs can appear quite quickly like coughing so you need to investigate coughing in young stock uh, be mindful not everything is lung worm but be coughing in young stock when it occurs you need to act fast and talk to your vet i'm going to cover lung worm maybe on its own again but for round worms in dairy calves pool fecal egg samples so if i have a group of 40 calves there and i want to take eight to ten of those uh, eight to ten fresh dung samples off them every three weeks now it seems like a lot in sheep farms now we're moving even to shorter periods of time every three weeks you're looking at pool fecal egg counts to see what worm egg counts are like clinical signs are okay weights are okay we're timing our doses we're leaving a bit longer we're also allowing this immunity to develop to roundworms in the first season so we're going to have less dosing in the second season what we find is if you dose heavily in the first season the second season becomes just the same risk as the first and then what we potentially have with the like of lung worm is you can have an issue in adult cows we don't want to be worming adult cows um, and again the lung worm story around immunity uh, if we can control that immunity with vaccination uh, i think particularly where we're seeing lung worm issues in dairy herds that's a that's a very very potentially uh, is a great tool uh, so then it's about strategic dosing and that to me is kind of an overview on um, without making it farm specific unfortunately of how parasites need to be controlled on farm um, and then we're trying to prolong our dosing and remember with your suckler calf at weaning time as well this is really important that if we have parasites in there particularly lone worm or round worms on top of weaning stress you can really open the door by dropping down immunity so this this is a season long uh, project i'm going to cover liver fluke probably on its own again because it doesn't develop resistance it's an issue on certain farms the control strategies are different with rumen fluke i've seen it on uh, farms and it causes scour again it can be an unusual and not a very common case with the immature rumen stomach fluke uh, traveling through the gut causing scouring and typically I, i've seen that anywhere from june to october in, in groups of calves so i think key thing about this to me as well is, is a bit of diagnostics that needs to be thrown in here when we're looking at parasite control okay um, so that's that's it to me um, round worms just really and I've said it I don't know how many times now weights clinical signs fecal egg counts and pushing out our dosing more strategically mindful that weather plays a role mindful that our grazing systems will have potentially a role in how we adapt them while still maintaining of course production and performance and that's the bottom line okay thought for today this should have been in yesterday's one um, I did cow signals yesterday and um, when I did cow signals uh, and I met you freezing and I met Martin Cavan, uh, another cow signals trainer, master cow signals trainer from Ireland, they really got me to think differently about farming systems. And today's thought is it should never be afraid to think a little differently. It's not always an easy place to be in, mind you, but thinking differently allows you just to look at things a little bit different and, and, and you know, set strategies we've always had. Just think about how we might move them, how we might do things a little differently, because everything's evolving and we have to sometimes just think a little differently. That's my thought for today. Happy, safe farming, but. Thank you.